Time-based control. Um, this is the, the most uh, difficult section in this, in this uh, training um, because the, the concept is kind of hard to grab to understand it fully. What is time-based? Time-based means that we, in, in a computer, you have a, a basic unit to actually do the counting, right? Like in, in any board that you actually have a crystal, when you apply a voltage, you actually doing the vibration, and then we use that as a, a clock, like in CPU or anything else, okay? So we have a clock. That clock doesn't actually provide the computer what's really the one second. It doesn't know. It just knows the count. It doesn't know what, what, how, how much time has elapsed. It doesn't know. So you have to give it a number. So to let it realize, like, okay, your how many counts is one second. Then this is how we actually can execute the motion program. Because when you actually say, okay, x, y, 1, z, 1, and then please do tm equal 10, that means in 10 milliseconds, do this move. How does he know it's 10 milliseconds? How does he actually execute this? This is how actually you perceive time through his counter. Okay, so you have to give it a definition in that sense. Uh, the way we do that in here is just simple. Just do uh, sys dot servo period. Remember in the beginning when we actually set up the clock, we have a number say, oh, sys dot servo uh, period. That's the servo clock. And that's in terms of millisecond, I believe. A second or millisecond? Millisecond, I think it's millisecond. Give it a number, and then you will say, okay, whatever you define as your several cycle, then I will define that as the clock you define, the time you define. So that's the time sense you have, okay? Um, we also talk about the percent command. You, if you do n percent one and say percent, and you actually check the feed rate on that coordinate system, right? So that means for different coordinate system, you can have different feed rate. You have 128 coordinate system, you can actually have all different feed rate for all these coordinate systems. And let's just say that motion program one is executed in coordinate system one with 50%. But the same motion program can be executed in uh, coordinate system two with 100%. That's no problem because everything is separate. So even if it's the same motion program, we actually have different buffers to actually execute in different motion programs. Okay, so the time sense is also related to this fee rate I'm talking about for each coordinate system. Okay, this is how it works. Initially, we have a, a major overall system clock that you define. Okay, on power on, this time sense that you define by your clock is actually copied into 258 different locations for these two different 228 coordinate system. So initially, everyone is 100% if that coordinate is active, okay? So if you manipulate the percent that's in one coordinate system, it doesn't actually affect the overall system time sense. So you have a reference. That's how this percent works. Otherwise, if you don't have a reference, then there's no way you can actually do this, okay? So far, so good? Okay, so for this time base, we have a, uh, well, the reason that we get this percent, 50, that means, well, you compare the fee rate in this coordinate system to the overall system clock, and then you got a, a ratio, right? So this is 50%. So if you manipulate this coordinate system register to compare with this, then you can use a variable to actually manipulate the fee rate in this coordinate system. So you can actually use a variable to actually get it faster or slower if you have a variable to control that, okay? Okay, so these are understandable, good. Now, the next part is how can we actually do this using a, a encoder count? Meaning, on the norm, if you have a master, so to speak, as the main clock, Let's just say that your motor encoder moves 2,000 counts per second. This is the speed, right? If you have the speed, mm, 
Let's just say that I have a move. This is the usual uh, time versus uh, velocity. And you have these, this move. This is up to some certain speed, zero. And this is from zero second, 0.5 second, one second, and 1.5 second. This is the usual move that we have. If you have a master as a time base, Like this, meaning if I say uh, my master move from zero to 3,000 is equal to 1.5 second, then I can use your ma uh, uh, encoder count to actually map with the time that you proceed. Meaning if your master is not moving, that means that time doesn't start. I don't execute the move at all. If I move to a certain location with certain speed, then that means this is the one second I have to execute in here. So that's how this time base works. We have a master encoder count coming in. We evaluate between several cycles what's the count difference, and then we get the speed. Because in here, this is really a speed mapping, right? Because that means if you do 3,000 divided by 1.5, uh, to this, right. That means this is count per second. This is the master speed. So if the master is moving at this speed, that means the time proceed normally. If it's slower than this, that means this proceeds slower in time. So the move will execute slower. This is how we actually use the master speed to actually control the feed rate on the slave. OK? I'm just trying to explain the concept here. Everything good so far? So it's just a translation. So if I specify a nominal speed, then if I use uh, time-based control, then that nominal speed, at that speed, the slave coordinate system will actually do normal time. If I slow it down, it will actually be 50%, 40%, something like that. OK. Now, let's talk about the theory part here. So usually, the command position in here is the previous uh, position plus whatever speed you have with the time difference. This time difference is the between several cycles. That's what you, how you define it in starts several period. Okay? Usually, that's the, the number. Okay? So if you want to use the master velocity to manipulate time, that means it has to change this guy. So I can say every time that you pass that's not really that time, then you actually have different speed. Okay? So by changing the delta Tm value, for example, half of the value, then the execute speed will be half. Because whatever it's actually adding to the position, it's actually ha being half during the time process. Pro proceed. Related structure. Here's that what I mentioned. Sista server period. Okay? This is usually the same as delta Tn. Okay? Uh, you can manipulate that otherwise, uh, but usually we don't touch this. This is the overall system time sense. If this is wrong, then your, your uh, motion program execution will be wrong, totally. Okay? Core x dot p does time base. This is a, with, if you see a structure with the little p in the front, that's a pointer. So the rest, the, it has to equal some address, okay? Because you need the address for that. Usually the uh, default value is core x dot does time base dot a. Okay, so for each coordinate system, this is the time sense that I was talking about. Initially, on power on, then this is copied to this register, so you have a reference for that. Okay? This one, time-based loop. 
the slow rate is actually how fast you want to respond to a change of a percent. Meaning, if you suddenly move, uh, for our time based sense, if you move, if you change your master speed suddenly, that means the percent fee rate will change suddenly, right? How fast do you want to catch up with that? Okay? That's the change between several cycle, how much change you can have. That's the through rate to be. So if you want to uh, have a very fast response, then this lambda has to be large. If you want it to be like smooth and slow, but eventually you will catch up, then you can actually set this slow, uh, small. Okay, so depending on what kind of application you have. Okay. Um, and the unit is a uh, millisecond per several cycle, like I said. So it's actually checking between several cycle what's the maximum change on the time base register. Okay? So, external time base. So, once you understand how, how time is processed in PMAC, then external time base means that I used the external source as my time to actually execute the motion program. That's why we call external time base. This is why I have this master and slave uh, concept. The master will be the external time base injection uh, source, and the slave will actually whatever follow in that uh, coordinate system. So if you have this plot in here, like I have it over there, it's the same thing. So the master position related to the uh, time uh, we actually have a ratio called RTIF. This is the nominal velocity of your master. Usually it has to be in this unit, counts per millisecond. Over there I have per second, right? So per millisecond is two, okay? Choose the RTIF. This is usually the, you have to choose the nominal speed your, of your master, okay? Uh, usually we suggest you choose the maximum speed you can have on your master. Because whatever below, you can actually have a ratio. But if it's over, that means uh, you might saturate the register. You, you don't really know. Okay, so usually we suggest the maximum speed. Um, the RTIF is de determined by use, user nominal master speed in uh, counts per millisecond. And it's set desired to power of two. So this is the calculation thing. So uh, if it's power of two, it's easier for us to calculate. It's the integer thing. Uh, create encoder conversion table entry that the set the time base source pointer, which is like this. Remember I mentioned that this is a, the P desk time base. Initially it's point to the desk time base, dot A, right? Here if you point into some encoder register, dot A, we have a structure called delta pulse, meaning I will check the difference between several cycles. Then that, that's actually the speed, so to speak. So I put the pointer to the whatever master you have and then check the master difference between several cycles, then I got my uh, master speed. And I use that to actually do the calculation, meaning, okay, how many counts you, you proceed in one server cycle, then I know how much time elapsed do with your definition or of your time base. The other one is ECT uh, scale factor. So this scale factor is related to how we actually get the data from different hardware. The hardware I meant is the gate that's in here. So here is 24E3. If you have E2, then the lines that go goes into the hardware will actually have different register location. So that's why we have the scale factor. The gate 3 is 8-bit shipped, so it's 256. Uh, no, wait a second. Uh, this is not 8-bit. This is 8-bit? Yes, 8-bit. This is 9-bit. So this is depending on different hardware, you will have different scale factor to actually get the correct count difference from your master, okay? So you can see that this part is really the hardware part, that we are checking on the hardware what's the actual encoder difference between several cycles, and then we use that as the time, that to control the time base. Okay.
All good here? So the only thing you need to do first is choose the RTIF, which is the power of 2, and then put the pointer pointing to the master position uh, delta pulse in encoder conversion table, and put the correct scale factor. And then it's pretty much there. Although I say that, but time base, we have two different time base. Okay. One is the normal time base, the other one is the trigger time base. Uh, usually, the normal time base is where you don't need absolute synchronization for a specific position on the master, meaning I want to start my time base exactly on the index. You need the trigger to actually start the time base from there. Normally, if you just have a dummy, like uh, if you have a conveyor belt, you are running the time base of the encoder that's on the belt, and then whatever robots are on top that will actually doing the same thing according to the speed of the conveyor belt, then you don't really care. You just like, okay, start it, and then this one is get up to speed, and that's right, start my time base, and then it will do whatever it's doing right now. Okay? Um, so let me introduce the first one, the normal time base. Uh, here's the description. So basically, let me show you the structure here. This is like this. So this is the problem we have. You have a conveyor belt that's running, and motor one is this, uh, the master, which does not need to be under PMAC control. We just need encoder. Because the only thing that's coming in that's related to the time based control is whatever encoder coming in. So if you have a, a crappy motor, as long as we can actually have the encoder in the back, we can actually still use this as the time. OK? So that will save some money for you. So encoder feedback over there, and then this is the nominal speed that we are moving. And we have a, a cookie dough or sheet need to be cut. And it got a certain distance for this. So that means this need to be a cycle. This, there will be IO dropping down this uh, blade. And then you move this motor. This is under PMAC control. And then the, the other IO will actually get it up and then come back doing this cut. So, you can imagine that if you want the constant uh, cutting length, then this move has to synchronize with the uh, master speed. So when you speed up, then it will actually cut faster. If you slow it down, it will cut slower. Okay. So when you do your motion program, you program everything under the nominal speed. Meaning, how do I actually time how much time I want to go from here to here for the first cut? How much time do I retract the blade? How much time do I actually go back and do the cycle? And then make sure that the time will actually have this distance for the cutting. That's always under nominal master speed, the normal time sense. Okay? So after that, after you program that, and then when you engage the time base, and then this program will run itself uh, under the time base of, for the master. Let's go back to the uh, program, uh, the setting here. So I explained that according to the speed, nominal speed, 800 millise uh, millimeter per second. Uh, this is in motor one. The blade that's moving, it's under control of motor two in coordinate system two. Um, the wave is moving in nominal speed, and the cross cut should take 0.2 seconds. Okay, so this is how fast it will actually cut. Uh, of course, it won't cut a straight line. It will actually be a slightly angled one. But that sometimes is good enough for, for this. The cut is repeated every 500 millimeter on the web. So the first thing we set up is this, type 1. So you actually create another uh, encoder conversion table that's using the uh, motor 1. Uh, position. So here is the ACC 24E3 channel 0 servo capture. So that's the normal time that's coming from the uh, master. You are just using the same source put in into a different table to do the calculation. Remember this one, the servo capture? This is the same thing as your encoder uh, in table 1, right? 
because in table one is actually should be for more than one. But encoder conversion table is just a calculation table. So you can get any whatever source you want. So here, that's why I create the entry, because usually on the demo box, we have four motors. So the first four encoder conversion table already being used. So I start with uh, inc5. In table 5, type 1, using master, uh, motor 1 is the source. And here is the RTIF 2. And then you use that to actually calculate your scale factor. See here. Assign the time base to this table, because this is for the master. It will actually calculate the master position difference. And that's it. That's the setup. Done. Let's see the motion program. So initially, I undefined all. I check, uh, I define the two motor into two different coordinate systems. Remember, the master has to be in another coordinate system. Because if it's in the same coordinate system, you are chasing your own tail. Because you're not moving, the motion program is not moving. You're moving, the motion program is moving. Then that, that, that doesn't make sense. So it has to be another uh, coordinate system. OK, so ink, ta ink table type 1 and ink table p ink equal to this. And the cutting mode, this is what I define with the cutting mode, if it's engaging or not. Uh, Wait a second. Uh, yeah. And the cutting down is using this IO. So initially, TATS 0. So this will actually give you the constraint for the motor, because you are defining 0 acceleration time. So right now, the acceleration will be the uh, characteristic that you put in the motor for the limit. OK. Core 1P time base is actually engaged in here. Once you define this, the master position is coming in as the time base. Okay? And in table scale factor is this. Okay, cutting mode here, and then I put the cut down. So the blade is down, delay 100 milliseconds because I count the whole move has to be uh, how many seconds? Mm, where do I put it? Mm, that's a calculation. Okay. The total move should be six. Uh, where did I put that? Here. According to the spec that I have here, the total move should be like within 625 millisecond. And then you measure the time that's between the delay and then the cut, because the cut has to be finished in 0.2 seconds, right? So it's 200 millisecond. That's why I have this. So here, I delay 100 in here. I waste the 100 in 625. And I say TM200. That means this, the next move will be finished in 200 milliseconds. <coughs> X1000, that's from the cross path. Delay, stop another 100. Retract the cutter. And then go back to the initial position using 225. Millisecond. So the whole thing will be 260, uh, 6, 625 millisecond. This is the whole thing. And after that, I put it back to the normal uh, time without time base. OK? So when you execute this program, then if you don't move your motor one, then this won't move. But it's executing. It's waiting for you to actually get the time to pass. OK? So for all these, you have to use delay. Because if you manipulate time, then this delay will actually scale by the time sense that you have on the master. If you use dwell, then dwell is the absolute sense. That's reference to the overall system clock. OK? So the trigger time base is actually used to, uh, if you have a specific position that's on the master, you need to synchronize to. Uh, because, well, in this example that we're going to introduce is the counting of threads, okay? We're creating three threads on one workpiece with even 120 degree apart uh, manner, okay? So it has to synchronize with the first position with 120 degree apart to actually get this cutting, okay? 
The other uh, important thing for this for the threading is when you actually exercising force uh, from the from the tool to the uh, to the workpiece. Usually, when you touch the workpiece, it will slow down the workpiece. So that's why you need time base to actually make sure. Okay, in a tiny manner that the the knife is actually doing the proper speed according to the speed of the master. Okay, so that's one application that usually done in time base. Um, the trigger time base here, uh, the only difference is we need a trigger, meaning where do you want to start this time base? Uh, so we need to get, somehow to get this trigger when it happened and that we proceed the time base. Um, so in here, the previous setup are still fine with this. The setting of the RTIF, the uh, set the time base uh, res register to the master position in the encoder convolution table and set the proper scale factor and the slew rate. Okay? The different part is here. <coughs> you have to set your encoder convolution table type to zero, uh, to 10 on the master. This will force the calculation of this delta pulse equal to zero which in a sense is freezing the time base. It's actually not doing anything because whatever you, you have the master changing, I won't output any delta pulse difference on the master. So when you set the type to 10, it will actually do this. Why do you want to do this? Because think about this. You want to start a time base while the master is moving, right? With the specific position. So before you can execute the move that's on the workpiece, then you have to make sure that, okay, the trajectory uh, has been already planned before you see the trigger to start the time base, right? Otherwise, it, will, it won't match, okay? So the reason for freezing time base is because we need to wait for the trigger. And before that, you need some time to actually finish the calculation of the motion program for the trajectory, okay? Um, so once you see the trigger, which is coming from here, it's encoder table that p ink one. If the type is ten, the p ink one is actually monitoring the status of the flag. Okay, the reason that we have this gate three channel and status dot a is because all the flags are coming from that register. If you actually recall that we when we actually set up the motor. There is a flag status. Like, where do you actually get your plus limit and minus limit and index and everything? That's actually a pointer pointing to uh, this register. That structure is called motor bracket x dot p limit. Remember this structure? And that should be equal to this. It's actually getting the flag out of, uh, out of that status uh, register. So when you have the hardware in here, this uh, status.a is related to all the wire in the front, in here. So it's how we're getting the, uh, the, the flag, and this is the register. We are doing the same thing here, so the p ink one is actually pointing to, to this. If it's under ink table uh, type 10. If it's ink table 1, type 1, then this p ink 1 is not this. It's got some other meaning, okay? so. With uh, ink, tape, uh, ink table type 10, is actually doing this. OK. In here, you have to select which flag you want. OK? I'll introduce that later. OK? Um, then here, when you actually start a motion program with the nominal master speed, and that's after you get the flag, and then after you finish the motion program, then you restore the time base to default. So here's the sense. You are waiting for a flag to happen. But when you seize it, you don't change it in the motion program because you cannot. Because in the motion program right now, the time base is freezing because you select type 10. Okay? You need some external uh, switch to actually say, okay, I see the flag, and then please switch it up. To actually, when you actually see the flag, then you execute the motion program. So the basic idea is this. In the motion program in the beginning, you always freeze the time base. And then you have all the calculation for your moves and everything. Okay? 
And outside the motion program, you have a PLC that's monitoring the status of the time base. That's why here, if the PLC reads this type is equal to 10, I switch index 1 to 3. This index 1 is actually a mechanism that, OK, if I see the time base is freezing right now, I arm the time base to wait for the trigger. So there's a three steps, freezing, arming, and running. Okay? When you freeze the time base, that means the time, base, time is now running. And when you actually see the trigger, you use the PLC to arm the trigger, to wait for the trigger to wait, wait for the flag to happen. Once it happens, then it keep, you run your motion program with the time. Okay? Motion program is running, it's the time is not proceeding. Okay? So understand the three step thing. That is why you need a PLC in here to out, that's outside the motion program, because inside motion program, you cannot monitor this. OK? The other thing you have to understand is why there's the, what's the sequence between motion program and the PLC? The PLC got lower priority than motion program, right? So if the PLC got the chance to see, oh, the type is 10, that means motion program already finished the programming, uh, planning for that move. Otherwise, PLC got no chance to see this. So this is the priority thing that's in the uh, PMAC. We have a different priority task. The motion program is higher than PLC. That's in the background. Okay? So when the PLC sees this, that means, well, the, pl the, the trajectory has been planned, so there's no problem for you. Once you find the index, uh, uh, the flag, then you can execute. Okay? So that's why you actually arm the uh, time base in here. Okay? So this is the basic structure. When we talk about, about programming, then it, it should be uh, straightforward once you understand this. Any questions so far? No? OK. So we just play with the trick, then how do we actually wait for the trigger? OK. So here, we have the setup steps. Um, this is just an example that, like I said, we actually want to cut three threads in one workpiece. And the three threads are 120 degrees apart. So when you actually have the nominal speed of your master, that's, the, that's actually on the workpiece, then you can actually time how much time you will have between the threads when you actually do the cutting. OK. Initially, we actually start with the index to do the first cut, right? And the next one, because it's 120 degrees apart, you, with the nominal speed, you know how much time you want to delay to actually for the next cut to actually get this 120 degree apart. So the setup is like this. So initially, uh, an, like the uh, normal time base, we actually have another encoder commune table to actually get the uh, master position. With this RTIF, then you can actually calculate the uh, counts per millisecond and use that value to actually get the scale factor. So these steps are the same basically with the normal time base. The difference is, start from here, uh, actually here. Because for the uh, trigger time base, we usually want the uh, slave react to the master speed very quick. So we actually increase the slew rate to one. If you get into the manual, we'll check the default value. Default value is uh, 0.00001 with like five zeros. It's very small initially. So we set it to high value to make sure that we can actually track properly. And the motion program, the cutter speed is uh, this, according to the spec that we have in here. Time for one ref is 50 millisecond per ref. So you know that if you one third of a ref, then that's one third of this time delay for that. Okay? Uh, here. This is why I said uh, how you actually set the flag. When you actually say, OK, I want to get the flag from the status uh, register, but which bit is what you want for the index or the flag or whatever you want? This is from here. You have to select the flag you want. So gate 3 channel that capture control is like capture on what? Okay. This is the index. 
So it's equal to 1. First, you freeze the time base and set it up to 10 and check the status to get, get your flag from the gate. And you arm the trigger time base using your PLC and set the encoder uh, table 6, index 1 equal to 3. So when this happens, it will actually do things. So once it actually see the flag that you set, it will actually change the type to 1. Because initially, we set the type to 10, right? Uh, where is it? Set the type to 10 here. This is freezing. So when it, when it actually got the index to 3, and then when you actually see the flag, and it will actually change the type to 1. OK? So the time base will keep running. We will actually have the delta pulse from the master. So this is the uh, example that we have. So here, on the spindle, this is not under PMAC control. So we are only getting the f uh, encoder back. Okay. So we are controlling two motors in here. So this is X, this is Z in here. So you can imagine that I have to get in here and do the cutting. According to the speed of the spindle, I move this uh, Z axis. And then after here, I get out of time base because the only thing that you need a time base is in this cut, right? This part, you don't need it. OK? So only the cutting part time base, I get rid of the time base and then go back to the first location in here. And now here, I wait for it, wait for the index to happen. And then I do the next move according to the calculation of what I have for the next thread. OK? So it's freezing in here, arming by PLC, wait for the flag, once it happened, and then cut it in, and then do over and over for three times. Uh, here's the previous, uh, the initial setting. I have a different setting here. Um, so here are the slave are in coordinate system two, master in coordinate system one. Um, Initial type is 1, and it's actually getting the uh, encoder from master. Let me explain this program. <coughs> so initially, we go to the, the, the position that we want. This is the initial position that we want to start cutting. Okay? And slew rate is set to 1. Scale factor is according to the time base that you have on the master nominal speed. And the capture is on index. Okay, thread number is one. This is the which thread you want to cut. Okay, if it's less than three, then initially this is important. The dual zero is necessary because this is the part that you want to stop the stop the motion here and then make sure that you can execute this freezing thing. Okay, just wait over there. So here you set the time base to the master from encoder six and set type to ten. To freeze the time base. And this is where you get the flag, which is according to this, is the index. Linear move. And here it says that core.ta plus this. This TA time, see here, this is the TM time. So this is how much time you want to get in your knife into the piece. This is this move in here. Uh, this move in here. This move. So according to different threads, then you might increase this time to actually get the second thread, the third thread. That's why in here we have, uh, where is it, uh, TA plus the thread number multiplied by one uh, 20 degree of part time. OK, so each time you get in, it's like a, a one time delay, one time delay. So you get like three threads according. And so the speed in here, this is in, in the x direction. So you go in here. This is the, this this move, F80 and Z25 is this move to actually get the threads. Okay. So these two calculations is according to the uh, the pitches that you want on the workpiece. And after that, you do a dual zero stop and then put the time base back to the normal time uh, normal uh, desk time base, and then wrap it Z1 and go back. This is the part that you get out of the time base and come back. Okay? 
After that, you actually increase the index for the, th for the threading number and then come back again, do this again. Okay? So you can see here, there's no arming thing in here. Everything under this is doing freezing time base. So up to here, unless your master is moving, it won't moving forward from here. Ah, okay? So you don't have to worry about, oh, why is it, it changed the time base back, but will I get here? Before the, the, the trigger or something? No, it won't. It will actually, after the trigger, it will actually, actually go to this part, and then you get the chance to actually set the time base back. Okay? So that's how we do it. And after all this cutting, and then I retract the uh, tool tip to the home position, so to speak. So this is the, at the end. Let's look at the PLC. The PLC is just one line. So basically, I'm just waiting to see if it's 10. Initially, I set it up to one, right? Before the motion program. So if it's 10, that means the motion program finished the calculation, I, and I set the index to three, so wait for the trigger. If it happened, then I start the time base. Okay? Any questions? Okay, then let's do this practice. This is interesting, because you can see that if you don't move, uh, if you know where your index is on motor one, then you will actually see the result. Before the index, then your slave will actually wait until this trigger happens. So put these two programs in, and before you uh, execute your motion program, make sure you uh, make sure to enable the PLC first, so it, it can actually wait for it. So and then when you execute the motion program, you will see it. 